my left we have Jeneline. Jeneline will morning. be joining us this morning. <laughs> um, as per usual, this is going to be a one-hour introduction to philosophy and theory class. If you're joining us for the very first time, welcome. If you are a complete beginner, thus the better. <laughs> These classes are designed to be intuitive, hopefully um, interesting, hopefully... Oh, we've already lost the connection. Let's try that again. Okay, we're now back. Um, these classes are designed for beginners. They're supposed to be introductions. They're supposed to not be too technical. And at the same time, we try not to make them stupid. This is not <laughs> philosophy for dummies. This is philosophy, um, you might call it like dialectical philosophy. Now, what does it mean to teach in a dialectical fashion? It means this. You can start anywhere. It is a choose your own adventure. You can start with this class being your very first class. However, be aware that this class is also part of a larger series, a series called The Vanishing Mediator, in which we're talking about the relationship between, between Kantian transcendentalism and Hegelian speculative idealism, and the manner in which um, Slavoj Žižek tries to link Lacan to Hegel and then Hegel back to Marx. That is the enterprise that we are committed to here. Um, the only reason that we can do this open access, free, on the internet every single week is because we have the very generous support of a group of patrons. So a big thank you to our patrons. Thank you. And if you guys would like to join our Patreon, if you'd like to become a patron today, you will also get access to a lot of bonus features for this class, including audio downloads for every class. You get to join us for the live tutorial that we teach afterwards, our bonus discussion where you can also tune in live to ask us any questions you may have. Of course, you can also download this as a podcast if you're a patron. And of course, you can also get access to transcripts for every class, as well as my ebook titled The Hermeneutic Temptation. If you're interested in becoming a patron today and helping us keep these classes free for everybody else, please go to www.patreon.com dash Jeneline and Julian, or click the link in my Instagram bio or YouTube about page. That's my little... We always I think have that to sums say it that up pretty well. Yeah, I always have to bring that in. So big thanks to our patrons. Uh, we really appreciate it. And big thanks to everyone who's joining us from everywhere. Because one of the great things about teaching online is it means that our students are literally from around the world. So let us know in the comments where you are joining us from. And we love to see that. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, what makes us really happy is when you let us know where you're joining us live from. So if you're watching right now, please leave us a comment telling us where you are. We are currently in Washington, United States, mm -hmm. Spokane, Washington, USA, in the midst of a <laughs> snowstorm. For those of you who have just joined, here's another image of what that looks like. We are, like, in the midst of a pretty gnarly snowstorm. It just looks very drizzly. It just looks drizzly. That's yes, right. It's Okay, so what are we going to cover today? I, I want to talk about a couple things. I want to talk about um, a movie that we, we saw recently, which is called The Matrix. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about <laughs> we're going to talk about The Matrix. Um, hello to people from India. Hello to people from Moscow, Alabama, yes. California. That's wonderful. <laughs> Please do keep keep letting us know where you're tuning in yes. from. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about The Matrix and the philosophy of The Matrix. We're going to talk about a book that you and I have both been reading by David Graeber, uh, which is called The Dawn of Everything. An unfortunate title for a very good book. A fortunate book with an unfortunate title. Um, and along the way, we're going to talk about Hegelian idealism and what we can learn and say about Hegelian idealism. So I want to start briefly with The Matrix that you and I were watching. Yes. Uh, so Jeline this week uh, <laughs> invited me to go and see... On a date. On a date. To see The Matrix. Yeah. Yes, which I had not seen since it first came out in cinemas, which feels like not that long ago, but it was, in fact, quite a while ago. This is how you know that Jenlene is older than me, because um, I was like, I don't know, I was 10 years old when the movie came out, and Jenlene was in the cinema, like, I don't know, watching it. Yeah. That's pretty good. Well, I, I, I've never seen it in the cinema, so for me, that was a first. And we went to see the original 1999 Matrix, the first one. And uh, so a couple of thoughts. Um, mm. First of all, I mean, I'll give you some of my thoughts and then maybe we can have some of yours. And then yeah. we can kind of relate that to like what we want to talk about philosophically. I'm going to put mm -hmm. this coat aside. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a passage that I think is really interesting. There's like a little, I mean, it's all interesting, but there's a scene in which um, the, the agent, Agent mm -hmm. Smith, 
is interrogating, I suppose it's Morpheus. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to know these characters. And Agent Smith says that when they were building the Matrix, when they went through the first version of the Matrix, they essentially wanted to create a utopian Matrix. In other words, human beings would be plugged into an artificial virtual reality. And this would be a utopia in which nothing bad ever happened to you, in which everything was always good. There was no pain. There was no suffering. It was pure bliss. And he says that, interestingly enough, human consciousness resisted that idea. In other words, that utopia wasn't a convincing dream. The utopia that had, they'd created, the utopian version of the Matrix, was rejected by not just the body, but by, in a sense, the psychological people's psychology. People's mm -hmm. psychology. And so a new version of the Matrix was developed to which human beings much more readily um, adapted, which was a matrix filled with pain and suffering and thereby also with meaning and purpose and what we would call life. And, and I, I really, I like that idea because one of the, one of the classic ideas within both Levi Straussian anthropology and you could say the post-Marxism of someone like Ernesto Laclau is precisely that the truth of society, the core of society is a reflection of the core of human experience, which means that the truth of society is antagonism, which is a reflection of the core of human experience being about pain and suffering and hardship. Now, what's really important to note here is that it's not saying that human beings are inherently bad, that human beings are inherently evil, that we desire conflict and that we desire to suffer. It's that we only access reality through the perceived barrier of suffering, mm. which is a really important distinction. It's not that human beings are innately evil and conditioned to fight or that antagonism is the truth of us. Instead, in a Lacanian sense, antagonism is the real. It is without antagonism that we cannot conceive of society as such in the same way as we don't have access to the realm of reality other than through the barrier of pain and suffering and negation, essentially. And there's a very beautiful little twist in the Matrix there where, where, where they realize that, that you need to have what appears to be a formal barrier to life, whether it's pain, whether it's suffering, whether it's death, in order to have a convincing experience of reality as such. Now, that was something that I, that I thought was kind of interesting about The Matrix. But I was curious what your thoughts were as we went in. Yeah, no, I find that, I find that scene really, like, it's still really thought-provoking. But, I mean, as we talk more, in the intervening years, there's been so much more discussion about virtual reality and what does it mean to have an online experience. I mean, we used to say, like, if you're chatting with someone online, there used to be a concept of, I'll be right back. And that has gone away completely. There is no more be right back. We are always there. And so what's interesting to me about that is that we have created utopian spaces. And I think online games function as that kind of utopian space. Not to say that there isn't like discord and disharmony and trolling and bad things, but we've integrated that into making the utopia as a way to compensate for the injustice that we see in reality. And so it's very, it's it, precise, I'm not explaining this very well, but it's precisely in the trying to create a utopia that allows us to, in some ways, tolerate the problems in the world. Right. It's not about bringing those problems into the utopia, it's about creating like a kind of displacement. I mean, it's interesting what you say also about how we have different layers of virtual experience. Mm, yeah. So one of the classic um, Lacanian arguments is that fantasy sustains reality. And usually we think of it as the other way around. We think that it's reality sustaining fantasy, that fantasy is an escape from reality. And for Lacan, it's always the other way around. For Lacan, it's always that fantasy allows us to inhabit reality. Mm -hmm. And... I'll give you a couple of examples of this. But th yeah, I think that's uh -huh. exactly the point that I'm... He puts it so much better than I do, no, which no. is to say that it's the utopian elements of the game or of the online experience that facilitate, that make the injustice or the problems of reality bearable, yeah. in a sense. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's exactly what I was trying to hop <laughs> off on. Like, I think it's super interesting. But see, what's really important here is that we can actually go a step further, which is to say that increasingly reality 
is the fantasy that supplements the virtual, mm -hmm. which is a formal inversion of what Lacan's insight is. Now, I'll give you an example that anybody can understand. Let's say that you're in a car. When you're driving in a car, the reality outside of you takes on a distinctly virtual appearance, mm -hmm. which isn't to say that you think you're in a video game. You know you're in the real world, but part of the pleasure of being in a car and driving a car is that you feel sequestered from the world around you. Of course, the one thing that could break that illusion would be to have a vehicular collision, <laughs> as we've nearly had in the, in the, on the ice this morning, when reality, in a sense, comes biting back at you. It comes mm -hmm. breaking right in. But there's a sense to which, even though you are in this relatively virtual environment, increasingly surrounded by screens and navigating mm -hmm. software and algorithms, etc., what we experience as virtual is the hard, the hard real world around us. Mm -hmm. And so one of the fundamental shifts that occurs within our experience of the virtual is that we fill in the real through fantasy, but vice versa, we also experience reality increasingly as virtual. Um, I don't want to like do too much about virtual reality here yeah, yeah. because there's a lot to be said. Mm -hmm. um, I want to focus a little bit on this idea that um, is really famous within the matrix which is the option of having a blue pill or a red pill. Mm. Famously, Morpheus at one point offers Neo a blue pill and a red pill. And he says, the blue pill will send you back into the matrix. You will be plugged back into virtual reality, mm -hmm. essentially. And the red pill means that we will, we will give you the truth. Now, on the surface, this is simply the classic metaphysical framework, the metaphysical framework that goes all the way back to Plato, where we have the world of essence, the world of the idea of pure form, and we have the world of appearance, which is for Plato a false version of that, a, a copy. Now, the question, of course, is does Neo really have a choice? When you're, prevent when you're presented with the truth and... Um, I don't know, illusion, going back mm -hmm. to the Matrix, in order to present that choice, he's already been made aware of a fundamental break. Because you cannot present those pills within the Matrix as such. And so what we have here is like this kind of um, like purgatory type space. Like if you look at Dante's, Dante's Inferno, Purgatorio, Paradiso, purgatory is that space in which you exist between paradise and and hell mm -hmm. it's that it, and it's specifically the space of human agency or you could also say human rehabilitation <laughs> that's sort of the function of the idea of purgatory is that it's where the human soul isn't material as such but exists as pure potential to be recycled as it were <laughs> and so when neo's offered the choice between the blue pill and the red pill neo's essentially being offered something which has already happened. He has already woken up to the truth. Well, and this is also this also gets back to a theme that you've talked about before. The the decision has already been made. It just needs to be ratified or formalized in some way. And yeah. that's exactly that scene. Yeah. Exactly. That's that's what Neo has to do. Is Neo is formalizing what has already happened. In other words, what has happened to him now has to be embraced as his own autonomous choosing, his own autonomous agency. <laughs> Something that has occurred seemingly to him as a passive subject now becomes the condition of his own awakening as a subject. And this is sort of the idea of having to inhabit the space. And so if, in a sense, Neo has to choose the red pill, mm -hmm. there's, there's almost a manipulative element here. But this is what's also quite beautiful about the Matrix because it's exactly at the point where Neo chooses the red pill that he doesn't believe in his own... Um, that he is the one. The, the irony and what's really beautiful about the Matrix is that the exact moment at which Neo is supposed to wake up to reality, to the truth, to the hard um, desert of the real, as, <laughs> Morph as Mor 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 Morpheus puts it, it's exactly at the point that Neo makes the formal choice to be woken up that he is completely immersed in ideological fantasy. Yeah. And what is the ideological fantasy? You were going to say? Well, it's human agency. No, no, the, the, no, 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 no. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The ideological fantasy is that he is the one. Yeah. That Morpheus is a essentially a religious fundamentalist who believes in <laughs> someone called the Oracle who has told him something that seems to be entirely contradictory with what's happening in the world. This is the, 
the really beautifully ironic twist of the Matrix, and we're going to talk more about why it's necessary, by which Neo makes the formal choice to become woke, essentially, <laughs> and then realizes that this reality that he inhabits is entirely structured by fantasy, yeah. by you are the one, mm -hmm. and whether or not he can live up to that. You were going to say something. Yeah, no, that was, that was the perfect point. Because he's still, I mean... It's not that he rejects taking of the pill. And I think that the scene became a really potent internet meme in terms of, you know, if only you could see through ideology, then you could control your surroundings. And the point isn't you can either be plugged in or unplugged. You're always going to be plugged into something. The question is, what is that something? Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned here that the red pilling and the blue pilling has taken on such cultural force. In part, that has to do with the fundamental weakness embedded within the narrative of the Matrix, which is this. Are we going out? I'm going to... All right, let's go on an adventure. Do you want to come? Sure. What are we going to do? <laughs> I'm going to go get coffee. Oh, let's go get a coffee. <laughs> what about YouTube, sweetie? Oh, oh. <laughs> no. I'll... Are you going to get coffee? It's going to take one second, I promise. Okay, I'm going to be here by myself for a while. That's fine. I can manage. Fundamental weakness. All right. In the Matrix. Gentleman's going to get us a coffee. We'll see. All right. This is so weird by myself. Excellent. Um, okay, so we're still talking about the Matrix. And the problem with the Matrix, and this is something that Salvo Zizek has pointed out as well, is that the red pill, blue pill decision is presented within the classic formal structure of the transcendental metaphysics. In other words, you have a choice between essence, between truth, and fantasy, fiction, illusion. And it is your subjective, I don't know, mission to wake up, to seek the truth. Now, what Zizek has pointed out, which is simply a Lacanian point, is that there is no binary distinction between essence and appearance between the blue pill, uh, sorry, the red pill and the blue pill. There is no binary distinction between the truth and the world of illusion. Instead, Pache, Lacan, and Pache, Zizek, the ultimate fantasy is the idea of there being an eternal essence. In other words, and this is again Zizek's Lacanian take on Hegel, Rather than having a binary distinction between essence and appearance, between red pill and blue pill, instead, essence only emerges through appearance as such. This is one of the most important Hegelian ideas within Hegelian speculative idealism. And so what Zizek does through Lacan is to make a Hegelian point about the matrix, which is the following. When you are presented with the choice between a red pill and a blue pill, the fundamental fantasy is, of course, the idea of waking up. And so rather than rejecting fantasy in order to seek the truth, the truth of fantasy is that truth only appears as fantasy. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about how that works in Hegel because it's clearly complicated, but it does help you explain why within our culture today and our cultural consciousness, the idea of the red pill and the blue pill has taken on such a reactionary form. Because at its heart, the idea of rejecting the illusion of society and waking up to the truth has a distinctly conspiratorial bent. It's the idea that you are the one precious person who has seen through the facade of society as it exists, and now you can reject said society because you live on a higher level. That's also the secretly reactionary content of the entire story of Plato's cave. It's the idea that there's one individual who believes himself to be better than everybody else because he believes that he's exited the cave. Now, of course, you could immediately imagine a Rupert Murdoch type empire, which promises you that you are leaving the cave by consuming fake news on the internet, etc. That would be that would be the take. Jeline is back. It is I did not spill any coffee, but... It is, it is extremely <laughs> awkward for me to do this by myself. It's funny, like, we often get asked, like, why is Jeneline here? And, and that's, first of all, it's a sexist question. But second of all, Jeneline is here because this relationship we have with you guys as students is distinctly parasocial. In other words, as much as I would like to know you, 
I don't know you. And so when I look at these screens, I see myself. In fact, I see myself twice. <laughs> I see myself on the Instagram screen and on the YouTube screen. And by bringing Jeneline, Jeneline brings me back to reality. <laughs> and so, I ground you in the real world. Exactly. It's only through you that I have access to this virtual space. Is there milk? Or? There is milk. Here. I'm going to do that. Quite a bit. We should have done it the more. other way around. Poured it in the travel mug. Yeah, go for it. Is this all for me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. Thanks a lot. Mm, this is our first coffee of the day, by the way. Well, if you pour it in here, it'll stay warm. That's up to you. Now, I want to go... That's a very good cup of coffee. Wow. <laughs> okay, so we're still talking about the Matrix here. And so what's, what's interesting about the Matrix is that when Neo formalizes the decision, which in a sense has already been made for him, because to offer him the pills means he's already seen enough of the quote-unquote truth that he now has to assert his own agency. It's exactly in the moment that he awakens that he realizes that the truth is simply that he's now stuck within Morpheus's <laughs> ideological fantasy of him being the one. And what's really important, and where we make the transition from classic transcendentalism, which is the idea of the blue pill and the red pill, in other words, the binary distinction between essence and appearance, or truth and fiction, or you, mm -hmm. you understand, is precisely when Neo meets the Oracle. I'm going to take a cup of co sip of coffee here. Yeah, you should. Enjoy it. So when Neo meets the Oracle, actually I'm going to transfer Yeah, and I think someone had pointed this out, which I'd never really noticed, that there's some, there's some like, you must accept cookies before the Oracle will run, something like that, what? which is sort of a great... Because Neo accepts a cookie from the Oracle. Oh, yeah, Isn't yeah, Isn't this yeah, a yeah. whole, I feel like it's a whole early internet joke. The, the... The really speculative moment within the Oracle encounter is when she says, it's okay, I'll clean it up. And he says, what do you mean? And he knocks down the vase. <laughs> and then the Oracle turns to him and says, sort of with like a cheeky smile, she says, now what's really going to cook your noodle is you're going to keep wondering, would you have broken the vase if I hadn't said it's okay to break the vase? And that's very that's a very speculative moment in a sense. <laughs> Positing of the presuppositions <laughs> to be very like technical here. Okay, so what's really important is that the Matrix functions in two stages philosophically. It starts with classic transcendental choice between the higher substance of truth, of reality, of essence, which is embodied by the red pill, versus the world of illusion and appearance, and in, in this case, literally virtual reality, of the blue pill. Mm -hmm. However, the movie is more clever than that. And all the people who are like the incel, blue pill, red people, I've woken up people, fail to understand the more radical dimension of that. Which is that as soon as Neo meets the Matrix, he's essentially told, spoilers, spoilers for the Matrix, by the way, yeah. that he is not, uh, when he meets the what? He meets the Oracle. Did I, what did I say? The Matrix. Oh, when he meets the Oracle, the Oracle says, you are not the one. I'm sorry to break it to you, but you are not the one. <laughs> and Neo, of course, is, is, a little bit terrified because he already thought he wasn't the one and now everybody thinks that he is the one and he is going to it's going to be his fault if humanity is extinct okay what's really 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 important here and this is how we make the leap towards speculative idealism and i'll explain it a bit more is that the only way in which neo becomes the one is by not being the one in other words, if Neo believed he was the one, he wouldn't become the one. If he was told he was the one, he wouldn't be the one. Neo is only the one because he is not the one. Now, that seems on a common sense level to be incredibly dumb. But here's, here's how we can make sense of it within Hegelian speculative idealism. And I want to start with a joke. There's actually two jokes. I was reading the New Yorker magazine. The New Yorker magazine has um, like a shouts and murmur section where they have like jokes. And in this one, they'd written various epilogues. So like endings to stories that were written as jokes. And two of those epilogues function beautifully as <laughs> examples of speculative idealism that will help you understand the matrix. I, I think I've already told them to you, right? Yeah. I don't remember exactly how they went, but one of them is like this. Oh, I should have written it down. <laughs> um, basically... It says, um, sadly or tragically, the philosopher who invented irony was accredited with having invented slapstick. 
I mean, it's not a laugh out loud joke, but the philosopher who invented irony was accredited with having invented slapstick. Now, what is the joke here? The joke is that the joke is ironic. Mm -hmm. It's ironic that the person who invented irony became accredited for having invented slapstick, another comedic device. However, the real question is, did he really invent irony? In a sense, he only invented irony because his invention was misattributed. In other words, in a radical teolog <laughs> teleological sense, he hadn't a priori invented irony until that which he hadn't invented was misrepresented as slapstick and thereby, seemingly out of nothing, emerged irony. In other words, the very fact that he was mis misattributed slapstick created the invention of irony retroactively. This is, it's terrible <laughs> to explain jokes, but like this is the formal structure of that joke. It's like the perfect illustration of the teleological move of speculative idealism, where you don't start with an a priori, which is then negated. Instead, it's through the negation that the a priori retroactively comes into being. Okay, another example, another joke. I'm not expecting anybody to laugh, although you can hit the like button. <laughs> the other joke is a little bit easier, but has the same mechanism. It's, and it's, again, an epilogue. An actor, having failed to make the transition from drama to comedy, decided to throw himself in front of a steamroller. A steamroller, of course, being a very slow-moving object. Now, what is the joke? I'm going to kill this joke again by explaining <laughs> it. An actor, wanting to transition from drama to comedy, in other words, to go from being a serious actor to being a funny actor, and failing to do so, throws himself in suicide in front of an extremely slow moving vehicle. <laughs> now, if you've watched the movie, and I don't think you have, but if you've watched the movie, what's it? The it's Spy the, Who Shagged Me. Oh, no, the I'm Austin, thinking the John, there's a John Cleese uh, movie with a- Austin Powers, mm -hmm. sorry, do you wanna? No. So Austin Powers, The Spy Who Shagged Me, there's a scene in which a man is killed by a steamroller. <laughs> And steamrollers are, of course, very <laughs> slow. And so the man goes like this. Ah, and the steamroller goes. Mm, and he goes. Ah, mm, and of course, he would have had plenty of time to jump out of the way. Instead, he's just like transfixed. Ah, and then he gets crushed like really slowly. Of course, the comedic element is simply that something that should happen in an instance. Bam, you're dead. Happens slowly. But in the joke where the actor who failed to transition from drama to comedy threw himself in front of a steamroller... That is, again, Hegelian speculative idealism. Why? His very failure to go from drama to comedy resulted in comedy. In other words, the very condition of his, of his failure became retroactively his success. There is no shortcut here. And it's, I mean, I think the best way to think about it in your own life is to consider a time when you have ever given up on something or thought that something was not going to be successful is precisely when something becomes successful, whether it's your student work or in a relationship or job applications or, I don't know, whenever you think that you've tried everything and something is simply not going to work, it's the act of giving up that allows something to come to fruition. Although I have to push back ever yes, so slightly because do. what's really nice is that you've actually set up something that like is like a, <laughs> would work as a straw man, <laughs> which is which is this. It's very important to note that for Hegel, the barrier is never just an obstacle. The barrier is always an internal limit. Now, what do I mean by that? First of all, if you wanted to have Hegelian ideology it would be the very idea that everything exists as a barrier to be overcome. Oh, look at this wall. This wall just exists to test you so that you can become the higher form of you who has climbed this wall. Oh, look at this incredibly disgusting food. This only exists so that you can train your taste buds or something like development of taste. You end up in this like very like, I don't know, um, Machiavellian ends justify just, what is it? Meets justify. Um, meets just the cause mm -hmm. where everything that appears to you as an obstacle is in fact the condition of its own success. Mm -hmm. That would be Hegelian ideology. That would be, that would be bad. That would be perverse. <laughs> What's really important is that the shift doesn't take place as in you've overcome something. The shift takes place internally. It's a purely perspectival shift. 
Um, and I'll try to give you, I'll try to give you an example of this, but like, it's not always easy to do so. Let's go back to the joke about, oh no, back to the joke. <laughs> Let's go back to the joke about the, the man who, um, the philosopher who was wrongly accredited with having invented slapstick when he in fact invented irony. Mm-hmm. The joke only works because irony comes too late. That is, of course, what irony is, in a sense. Irony wasn't there, and he overcame it to become something else. Instead, the seeming negation, the thing that it is not, Mm -hmm. slapstick, is what retroactively produces the ironic moment, the moment of the joke. And what's really important about the classic Hegelian idea of negation of negation is that it is never simply the positing of an obstacle to be overcome. It's never just we have a positive substance followed by a negative substance followed by a third substance. If that were true, we would be stuck in the Fichtean universe of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Of course, one of the great ironies of the way in which Hegel is taught at most universities is precisely that people say that Hegel was about thesis, antithesis, synthesis. In other words, a three formal moments of progression where you start with a positive substance, which is then negated into its opposite, and it emerges as like a new. It's like, this is the Pokemon version of Hegel, where essentially it's like, you start with one Pokemon, and then you battle it against other Pokemon, and then suddenly it goes, oh my god, your, uh, I don't know, your Pikachu is evolving. (laughs) That would be not at all Hegel. That would be the Thesentistus synthesis. Mm -hmm. What Hegel says instead is that rather than being a one, two, three movement of progression, the negation of negation is an entirely internally mediated substance by which one thing that was X appears to be its opposite, thereby revealing its original true form. Okay, let's fill that in with something less abstract. Let's go back to the matrix. In Neo's encounter with the Oracle, the Oracle says, you are not the one. Mm -hmm. And Neo is relieved. He says, huh, That's what I've been saying the entire time. I am not the one. And it's, of course, precisely through his awareness that he is not the one that he becomes the one. He wouldn't have become the one. In other words, there is no formal external obstacle. Mm -hmm. It's not saying, Neo, you are a man, but if you train sufficiently, you will become the one. There's no progression where Neo is positive substance. He is faced with um, conflict, and then through overcoming conflict, he becomes the one. Mm -hmm. Instead, Neo's oneness rests only in the fact that he believes he is not one. You are not the one, and now I will start acting as if I were not the one. In other words, negating the very substance of oneness. And through that acting as if I were not the one, I become the one. That is the speculative idealist moment. That is also how we go within the matrix from the classic transcendental choice between essence and appearance between the red pill and the blue pill towards a much more sophisticated speculative idealism by which the barrier to the thing exists within the thing itself. That's, I hope it's not too technical, but it's really fun. I mean, it's cool. So there's a couple of things that I want to, should we take a breath maybe? Yeah. Briefly? Okay, I know I'm going <laughs> very fast. Take a sip. Yeah, no, I think it's really helpful because you're absolutely right. It's really easy to oversimplify that. But And I, I understand that these these structures and these terms can be really abstract if they're new to you. But I think what's helpful, especially with cinema, is once you recognize these forms, you start seeing them in different contexts. And that's the use of theory in, you know, studying literature and studying cultural, you mm-hmm. know, cinema and theater and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. Thanks for buying me some time. <laughs> and coffee. Super welcome. appreciate it. Um, there's something kind of interesting about So this, okay, I want to make like a bigger argument, but I'm going to do it like, it's a bigger argument, but we're going to do it in easier terms. Um, And it works like this. The entire history of philosophy has always developed by perceived breaks, radical distinctions, differences with what came before, entirely new ways of seeing the world. For example, if you look at Plato, we think of Plato as being like the you know, founding father of Western mesophysics, which in a sense he is. And at the same time, it's important to note that Plato was responding to a revolution within human thought, which was presented by the sophists. If you really want to start with Western philosophy, you start with the sophists. Now, what the sophists did was to undermine the certainty of myth. In other words, on the realm of myth and the telling of myth and mythical narratives within ancient Greek society, 
there was essentially a hermeneutically closed um, system. Everything happened for a reason. The sun happened because the gods said X. People were black in Africa because the sun had scorched them or whatever. I mean, there was like all these ways in which we came up with ways to, to justify the so-called natural order by means of mythical elements. Mm -hmm. Everything can be explained because the gods at a certain point did something. Well, and that's what's so satisfying about studying Greek mythology is it feels like there's a story for everything. There's a character for everything. There's an attribute. There's a, everyone seems human in a sense. Yeah. yeah this is like the utopian element of Greek antiquity of, mm -hmm. of myth making is that everything happens for a reason. This is the ultimate fantasy, of course, that everything has a purpose, that nothing happens by accident. In fact, even the accidents were meant to be intentional. <laughs> um, this is the world of myth, the hermeneutically sealed world of myth, which is very comforting. And what the sophists, what the sophists accomplished was to fundamentally undermine the security of myth as a hermeneutic structure, saying that you could actually, the way in which we articulate and speak, the way in which we structure our understanding, our reason of the world, itself can be manipulated and can shape our understanding of reality. Mm -hmm. In other words, to experience a sophist, having come from the tradition of myth and the hermeneutically sealed myth understanding of the world, is a very radically disorienting experience. Suddenly everything can mean anything if you're sufficiently capable of framing it in such a way. Now, Plato reacts to this, in a sense, by creating the idea of metaphysics, where we have the red pill of truth and the blue pill of illusion. It's super important to understand that Plato is making a reactionary move to try to cope with the event that is the sophists. He is positing a rigid system in which we have an external truth and a world of illusion. Mm -hmm. Because think about it again, the sophists basically argued that rather than everything happening for a reason, everything could be manipulated and framed to have happened for a reason. So they fundamentally destabilized our experience of reality. Plato comes in and says, yes, but all of that happens in the world, which is a false copy of a higher ideal form. In other words, Plato, very ironically, is already pre prefiguring something that Kant ends up doing. Now, what does that mean? Remember, for Kant, this is what I call the Kantian cop-out. I can't believe nobody else has like, for, <laughs> coined it like this. But the Kantian cop-out is that Kant, in his so-called transcendental turn, says that in the distinction between reality, truth, red pill, and illusion, appearance of blue pill, that the subject has primacy, right? In other words, that reason is itself the internal barrier of essence. However, Kant upholds the idea of there being an ideal substance of a godlike realm, in fact, of God himself. And so Kant does something analogous to Plato, which is that Plato says, you sophists have introduced the idea of essentially like um, a relative reality of appearance. And now I'm going to set in stone the idea of an eternal truth substance, a red pill. And Kant does something similar in the Kantian cop-out where he says that, yes, we cannot access the truth because we can only access the truth through subjective reason, which means that subjective reason is what keeps us from the truth. However, the truth is still out there. Kant, in offering you the blue pill and the red pill, still says that there is such a thing as a red pill. It's only Hegel, it's only Hegel who makes the necessary logical inferral from that, inference, which is that Hegel says, who says that there is truth out there? Who says that there is a transcendental realm that is privy to the truth? Instead, the truth has to be in appearance itself. One of Hegel's famous aphorisms is that appearance comes as appearance itself. And that essence emerges only as appearance coming as appearance itself. And so if you go back to the Matrix, and this is something that Zizek has argued, because Zizek is making the same argument Lacan and Hegel would have made apropos <laughs> the Matrix, is that when you are presented with the formal transcendental decision between the blue pill and the red pill, the ultimate fantasy is, of course, that there is such a choice to be made in the first place. The ultimate fantasy is that there is an external truth that can be separated from the world of fantasy. Instead, the Hegelian third pill is always the pill that posits that essence is only in appearance and vice versa, that the very idea that essence would be external to appearance is itself the fundamental fantasy. 
for Plato, that is so true. Plato, in reacting to the sophists, posits the idea of essence as being set in stone out there because he doesn't want to give it to the sophists. Kant does the same thing. Kant posits that even though subjective reason has primacy over the so-called like essence or a priori, he still posits that essence exists. It's only Hegel who says, hey, Plato, hey, Kant, don't you realize that the ultimate illusion is what you've created? Namely, the ultimate fantasy, the ultimate illusion is that essence exists out there by itself, that essence exists as a non-mediated substance. And so what Hegel does is that Hegel mediates the appearance of essence within appearance itself. Technical, but so important. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give you some examples of this because we're already getting very close to understanding how Zizek then uses Lacan and the Lacanian real to supercharge this idea. Because Lacan would essentially say that the real, in other words, the traumatic kernel, the indivisible remainder, the thing that we cannot confront that yet contains the truth of the situation, is of course this. The real of the red pill and the blue pill is that it's not really a choice because Neo has already awoken to the choice. In other words, as soon as you are presented with the formal choice, you are in a sense forced to formalize that choice. I mean, otherwise you're an idiot. Otherwise you're just going back into the matrix. There is something distinctly cringe about not acknowledging an event. I'll give you an example. The atonal revolution within music. One of the funny outcomes of the atonal revolution within music, Schoenberg, etc., it's not that we no longer listen to tonal music, right? It's not you had the atonal revolution in music and now nobody listens to tonal music. Now, if you don't, like, if you're not aware of what these things are, atonal music is music that is essentially not very pleasant to listen to, you could say. It's the stereotype of modern music. Yeah, it's not designed to please your ears. Um, tonal music is designed to please your ears. Now, what happens after Schoenberg isn't that we stop making tonal music. It's that all tonal music seems to be a little bit cringe. In other words, tonal music becomes kitsch. Mm -hmm. Now, why does tonal music become kitsch? It's because of this. Atonal music was a radical shift, a radical turn, a revolution in music. And so when you're faced with any revolution, you basically have to make a choice. Either you honor what has changed, you accept it, you embrace it, or you simply pretend as if the change had never happened. Now, if you listen to Chopin, for example, <laughs> Chopin simply pretends like the revolution never happened, which means that even though Chopin is beautiful, and I listen to lots of nocturnes, strictly speaking, it becomes kitsch. Why? Because it's pretending like the atonal revolution didn't happen. It's persisting in the thing as if there hadn't been a radical take on it. Mm -hmm. It's also why today, if somebody paints a perfectly beautiful still life, with classical techniques and presents it at an art show, like it could be, it could be as good as anything done by, I don't know, by the Rembrandt, masters. by the masters. It would still be kitsch. It would be kitsch because it's pretending like the revolution of modernism didn't happen. And mm -hmm. it's something so painful <laughs> because there's so many good artists who would like to have been classically trained artists who now can no longer make that kind of art because it would be kitsch. That is the humiliation of any, any revolution, any evolution, is that it renders a persistence of the past, now not just as I'm doing what is traditional, now it's kitsch. That is the appeal of, I think, the pre-Raphaelites, who were English artists who did this incredibly, yeah, kitschy, hyper-realistic, hyper-romanticized, hyper-stylized, style um artistic um uh vision of painting that really tried to say let's 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 revert to classical mm. art let's pretend that um advances in art technique but also perception and theory never happened mm. yeah exactly right it's a form of nostalgia yeah. essentially yeah. and and what's what's important to note here is like this isn't just true for art i mean think about the pandemic when the pandemic started, we were all very preoccupied with the idea of going back to how things were. Then we introduced the idea of the new normal. And this is a very important shift. 
to act after the pandemic as if the pandemic hadn't happened would be perverse. It would be kitsch. And it's like little things suddenly are very different. For example, if you now blow out candles at a party, Mm -hmm. you're suddenly very aware of the fact that you're just spraying (laughs) germs onto the thing everyone's going to (laughs) eat. Suddenly, eating a cake and blowing out the candles doesn't seem like the icon of innocence and joy and the celebration of a year passing. It seems like the possible imminent passing of your own life (laughs) or passing on of germs or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so to I'm not saying that we should stop having birthday cakes or that we should stop having candles or that they become kitsch. What I'm suggesting is that the way in which we perceive it changes. And if you deny that change, if you try to live the way things were, that becomes like a weird, like a disavowal, a kitsch reenactment. Mm -hmm. And so what happens within philosophy is strictly speaking analogous to this. Whenever there is an event, a revolution, an enormous shift in the very axis by which the wheel of philosophical fortune turns, you can either choose to accept that and to take on the consequences, or you can try to essentially pretend like it didn't happen. Now, here we have to be a little bit more nuanced, which is, which is, I hope, which I think is worthwhile. If you want to understand Zizek and Zizek's work, I've always said that Zizek's work is trying to use Lacan to read Hegel in a more open way to then rehabilitate Marxism, dialectical materialism, the philosophy of Marxism. That is true, but there's a little caveat here. Strictly speaking, Slavoj Zizek believes that Schopenhauer, Kierkegaard, Marx, all of them failed to recognize the most important part of Hegel. In other words, all of them upheld the idea of an absolutist Hegel, where we're all going towards the absolute. And Zizek is saying that we actually have, that what they failed to do is that they failed to recognize the event of Hegel, and that you need Lacan to properly realize that Hegel was an event in order to then read Marxism in its proper form. It's a very roundabout argument. Essentially what Zizek is saying is that Marxism is kitsch. He's saying that Marxism is is kitsch because it fails to understand the most radical component of Hegel and actually still suggests that there is a Hegelian determinism, that there is a kind of Hegelian evolution where you have a positive substance faced with the material for Marx conditions of opposition through which a higher form emerges. The most crass version of that is, of course, within the Maoist conception of perpetually uh, opposites coming into conflict to create the higher form of substance. And so Zizek is saying, this is also why Zizek says he's not a Marxist. Of course, he's very much steeped within the Marxist tradition is to say, let's go back to Hegel, properly understand what was so radical about Hegel in order to then rehabilitate, revitalize what was so radical in Marx. In other words, to take away the, to rather than neutralize dialectical materialism to highlight its most important feature. Now, what is its most important feature according to Zizek? Why is Hegel so revolutionary? It's specifically because of this speculative process by which through an internal limit, the um, positive substance emerges retroactively. And I'm gonna give you an example of this. This is gonna be the final example of speculative idealism for this class. Thank you for holding on to your, holding on to your butts so far. <laughs> I'm reading a book, I just started reading it, that you've been reading by David Graeber. In fact, it's written by the Davids. I think it's yeah. David Graeber and David Renro. Mm-hmm. Is that how you pronounce the name? Yeah, I think Renro. So. And the Davids, as I'm gonna start referring to them, wrote a book called The Dawn of Everything, which is part polemic, part magnum opus, part uh, meta-narrative or anti-meta-narrative about the dawn of civilization and human society as such. And the book makes a relatively simple, yet very, very inflammatory argument. And it's this, traditionally, the way in which we conceive of modern civilization, of modern contemporary society, is either through the lens of Rousseau or through the lens of Hobbes. Within Rousseau, the idea is that there was a primordial, pure man. 
a purely equal person who lived in perfect equilibrium with his environment and surroundings, an Edenic kind of man. Man is born free, but everywhere in chains. Yes. Of course, this isn't necessarily true. I mean, even within the Garden of Eden, there's a clear hierarchy. But this is the Rousseau's man. Man is pure potential. And as soon as man modernizes and becomes part of a society and a community, etc., man is increasingly restricted. That is how we go from pure man, free man, to restricted, unequal man. Now, for Hobbes, it's exactly the other way around. Hobbes essentially argues that in, the pu- in its purest form, life is simply man against man. It's chaos and anarchy and fighting and survival of the fittest. Um, although, for if you want to hear my theory of the survival of the fittest, go back to my book, where I do like a lengthy take on why the fittest is a... Let's not. Okay. And so for Hobbes, for Hobbes, the idea is that man starts as pure chaos, as pure negativity, and that as society modernizes, man relinquishes some of his freedom, some of his anarchic freedom, and yet increasingly has access to liberties and to wealth and to civilization. So essentially, we have here a pessimistic model, Rousseau, who starts with the idea of pure existence, which increasingly is constrained by modern society. And we have the idea of um, Hobbesian society, which is that man starts as pure negativity and increasingly emerges into the positive order of being. Two models. Now, what David Graeber argues is actually very, very close to what the Lacanian argument would be. But of course, for David Graeber, the influence here comes from a different structuralist. It comes from Claude Levi-Strauss. It's very Levi-Straussian. Levi-Strauss argued that the truth of a modern society isn't that it is more equal or less equal. The truth of a modern society is that it can't decide whether or not it is more or less equal. In other words, in Lacanian terms, that is the real of a society. The real of a society is that it is fundamentally incapable of recognizing what makes it a society. What is the foundational principle of said society? Now, the classic example that Claude Levi-Strauss uses, which Lacan mentions, which Zizek mentions, which I've mentioned in before, so I'm not going to repeat it entirely, is the idea of a tribe. And anthropologists ask the tribe to paint a map of their village. The poor people in the tribe create a map of inequality, where the rich people are in the center and the poor people live on the periphery. The rich people create a map where everybody is equal. Everyone has equal opportunity. Now, the insight that Claude Larry Strauss has is the properly ideological one, which is that neither of these maps are true. It's not that the society is predicated on pure inequality, in which you have a 1% and a 99%, nor is it that society is equal and that some people are simply more equal than others. Instead, the very fact that neither group can understand what that society is That is the truth of the society. That is the part of no part, the indivisible remainder, the idea of the real for Lacan. And something similar happens, ultimately. I mean, does that so far so good? Mm -hmm. Something similar happens within David Graeber's argument. If we have Rousseau versus Hobbes, in other words, the Rousseaudian model in which we go from pure freedom towards restriction of freedom versus the Hobbesian model where we go from pure anarchy towards the creation of liberties, He says that here we have essentially two interpretations of what society is, what the story of mankind and civilization is, both of which, when viewed in combination, present us with the real of society. Now, what is the real of society, according to David Graeber, although he doesn't call it the real? David Graeber says, we have to ask, why were, quote-unquote, modern societies... um, interested in the idea of inequality in the first place. In other words, he's actually doing a classic Marxist move. The Marxist move is never to say, what is the content? What is the formal content? Instead, the Marxist move is to say, what is the, for- what is the content of the form? In other words, rather than saying, what is the content of an equal or unequal society? The question is, why are we asking about inequality in the first place? And I feel like I need to like hit 
the pause button here and back up because this is such a brilliant insight because, I mean, David Graeber as an activist was very much involved with Occupy Wall Street and the discussions over inequality following the financial, the 2008 financial crisis in the United States. And, and it had serious repercussions on his professional his professional work. And I think that this is a really important insight for people who, like myself, are really interested in the questions of economic inequality, but also, you know, social political inequality, which is to say, where does that obsession, that preoccupation with equality stem from? And what does it tell us about society? I, yeah, it's a great argument. So what's very cheeky though, <laughs> what's very, and David Graeber is a very dark wit or was a dark wit, very cheeky, very provocative is he essentially says that our obsession with inequality, and if you're a liberal today, you always put the word inequality in any book you write. Like, if we ask a liberal, what's the problem with society? We say too much inequality. The very cheeky element that David Graeber has, which is in a sense the truly leftist element, is that he says that the very obsession with inequality emerged under the historical social conditions of trying to legitimize colonial violence. Whoa, okay, big argument. So how does he get there? He gets here like this. Rousseau, in writing his tract on inequality, was answering an essay competition question, which I think was from the Académie Française, which was, is inequality part of the natural order? Mm -hmm. David Graeber says, first of all, we have to question why would Rousseau suddenly be interested in inequality? After all, his society didn't have a conception of equality in the first place. Equality wasn't a positive substance people talked about and thought, well, inequality is a diminishing equality. In other words, there was no equality to begin with from which inequality would be considered a fall in the way in which you considered today. And so why write about inequality if you don't have a concept of equality? David Graeber says what's more important here is the word natural order. Essentially, the ideological operation, in other words, the form, the content of the form, is to say Rousseau is trying to suggest and is being asked to make this argument in the essay competition that inequality is enshrined in the natural order, that it is inherent to nature that societies become more unequal as they develop. And David Graeber says, why would anybody want to make that argument? And then Graeber's answer is as follows. Through colonialism, through imperialism, increasingly, Western European societies were coming into confrontation with indigenous, tribal, native populations. And in that encounter, they realized that those societies had critiques of Western society. There were intellectual exchanges between native tribes and colonizers. And in that process, some of the intelligentsia of the native populations would say, why are Westerners so unequal? Why are Westerners so obsessed with money? Why are they so unhappy? Why are they driven by this fundamental antagonism? We have a different motivation. Now, what's important to note here is these native tribes weren't without antagonism. That would be a utopian Western idea, a romanticized image, which is totally kitsch, of the idea of the native who lives in perfect harmony with nature, etc. No, no, no. There was perfectly violent rituals mm -hmm. within native tribes, even including cannibalism, and yet that antagonism wasn't a fundamental structure of society in the way it is for the West. And so there was, an, I, there was a critical mirroring happening between Western civilization and native ideology, native structures of, of living. And so what happened was that the West, finding itself accused of being inherently unequal, then went to its own intelligentsia and said, we want you to provide us with reasons why inequality, which we are being accused of by the natives, mm -hmm. is not specifically Western, but itself part of the natural fucking order. In other words, we want you to justify our way of life as being innately natural, thereby, of course, retroactively suggesting that the native way of knife is unnatural, heathen, infidel, which gives us the natural authority to exterminate their way of life. 
And then to, of course, retroactively suggest that we are the survival of the fittest. Nature wanted us to be unequal so that we could eradicate the colonial natives. It's an incredibly radical, fascinating historical look at that interaction between, and it went on for hundreds of years, whether it was theological between um, conquistadors and indigenous tribes in the Americas or the Iroquois and the American founding fathers. I mean, it's such a, it's such a rich and fascinating history. And I think it's really been overlooked and I'm really grateful for this book. I just, I can't say yeah, enough. You don't have to cut yourself. <laughs> it's a bombshell argument yeah. and it's kind of like hidden away in like two paragraphs. And it's hugely inflammatory, of course. But the reason I'm mentioning it is that it functions as an example of speculative idealism. And of course, it also helps you understand how the structuralists like like Lacan and Levi Strauss are, in a sense, suitable to revivalizing speculative idealism, which is Zizek's whole project. Which is to say that in speculative idealism, you don't start with a formal substance from which there is a fall, and then you have like a new substance, the thesis antithesis the synthesis. Within speculative idealism, Hegelian idealism, there is nothing to begin with. The fall is what generates the illusion of the thing having been there in the first place. And that's exactly what happens when it comes to the idea of inequality. We don't start with the idea of equality from which we have the derivative, the negation of inequality, which then leads us to the higher form of civilization. Instead, there was no conception of inequality in the first place, uh, of, of, of equality. Instead, inequality becomes the mechanism, the vanishing mediator by which the so-called natural order of Western civilization is retroactively legitimized. That is, of course, also ideology. Here you find the link again from Hegel to ideology. Now, the idea of inequality becomes innate, it becomes naturalized, which, which is the story of Western civilization in many ways, and the very reason why we have an entire genre of books, the genre of books at which David Graeber takes aim, that are trying to tell us that Western civilization is the highest form of life. It's a simple continuation of that principle. Mm -hmm. Now, on that note, we're going to be wrapping up here, <laughs> but... We're going to talk more about this in our Discord tutorial, which is going to start in five minutes, because I want to talk about the 15th century and Ethiopia yes, being and the hub. Ethiopia being a hub of Christianity and an Ethiopian mission being sent to test the Pope in the 15th century. <laughs> yes, that's what we're going to talk about in the <laughs> tutorial, which is going to start in five minutes. However, for now, mm. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. Thanks if for you, sticking with us. If you've enjoyed this class, if you've enjoyed talking about the Matrix and about speculative idealism and Kant and Plato and um, David Graeber, please consider becoming a patron today. Mm -hmm. It really makes a huge difference in terms of keeping these classes free and open access. Our dream is to make these classes available to everybody anywhere for free. That is what we are committed to. And if you guys become a patron, you'll also get access to bonus content for this class. Um, I see we have a Dutch person. Um, that's very fun. I used to live in Holland. Kunnen ook Nederlands spreken, maar misschien is dat voor de Discord goed is naar Nederlands. If you'd like to become a patron and download all of the classes and bonus discussions as a podcast, plus get bonus features like transcript and access to my ebook called The Hermeneutic Temptation, please consider becoming a patron. It starts at just five dollars a month, and it really, really just means that we can keep doing this for as long as possible. So thank you so much. <laughs> Please do take a moment to click the link in our bio. Mm -hmm. And we shall see you in five minutes for our bonus discussion on Discord. All right. See you guys next week. Have a great week, everyone. Bye Happy bye. holidays.